Today, it's the battle of the sexes. Why he won't ask for directions. Why she talks so much. Do you have a couch for me to sleep on? How to end the fighting tonight. Then, the 20-second secret to better sex. Foods to make you frisky. This is an old remedy. Plus, it's the no embarrassment zone. Is it bad to hold in my poop? And open wide. Breathe into my mouth so I can smell. Three major warning signs in your mouth. Next. Energized audience. All right, we got men on one side, women on the other. It's an entire show devoted to the battle of the sexes. You know why? Because we have a crisis in America, a disease of sorts, and it's ripping us apart. Men and women just can't get along. But for the first time, scientists are close to unlocking the mysteries of why we sometimes hate our mate. Take a look. Since Adam met Eve, men and women have fought, bickered, and tuned each other out. Now, for the first time, scientists are beginning to unlock the mysteries of why we fight with our mate. The answer may lie deep inside the brain. Imagine the brain is a four-lane highway. Men are driving all the way over on one side. Women use all available lanes. It all starts in the womb. Boys get a burst of testosterone that triggers development of the left side of the brain. The side that makes men good at directions, math, and sex. As girls develop, the female hormone estrogen sparks more connections throughout the brain, both left and right sides. This extra horsepower makes women good at multitasking. Another difference? Language centers in the female brain are bigger, which helps explain a woman's gift of gab. That's why when we fight, the male brain wants to get to the point quickly and move on. The female brain wants to talk it out. It seems we are hardwired for a battle of the sexes. So to show you how this all plays out, especially for those of you at home, we're gonna play a little game called the battle of the sexes. All right, so I want you to meet our contestants. Kendra, how are you? And Mike, how are you? Fine. And they're from Maryland, is that right? Yes. You, and you've got, is that six kids? Yes. Is that right? So they've done pretty well for themselves. Here, here, here's how the game works. So Eddie and Kendra are going to sit there very peacefully. And before the show, I asked each of them to write down the answers to three questions, just to figure out how well you know your mate. And your answers are written on the cards in front of you. So we're all ready to go. Ready to play? Ready. Yep. All right, Eddie, here's the first question. How long does it take Kendra to get over a fight? <laughs> Do you have a couch for me to sleep on? <laughs> <laughs> I'll say uh, two days. Two days? Two days. Go ahead, Kendra. And the answer is one day. Mm. All right, now, the reason why Kendra actually often senses irritation a little longer and is frustrated by things is because she's got an overactive mind. Women are naturally supposed to be a little bit more attuned to the world outside of them, and especially be aware of the dangers in the world because they've got to bring up the kids. So they've got to be more alert to that. So that makes sense. So you're following the biology. All right, Kendra, when Eddie is driving and gets lost, <laughs> which is, I'm sure, a, often. a fairly often process, right. <laughs> very common. All right. uh, does he use his GPS? Does he stop at a gas station and ask directions? Or does he just drive around in circles? <laughs> he definitely drives around in circles, even to the point of running out of gas. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> All right, Eddie, let's see the answer. I suspect, stops at the gas station. <laughs> now why, why would Eddie get that wrong? Because I believe Kendra, of course Eddie runs out of gas. The reason is that, that Eddie's left brain is a dominant brain. Doesn't access the right brain because he's a guy. And the right brain gives you that sort of intuitive, holistic view of what's going on in the world outside of you. So Kendra 
Believe it or not, Eddie doesn't know he's lost. Right? <laughs> That's the fundamental holdback. I believe that. Right. And so when the women are getting mad at you, you think you got the whole thing worked out. You're not asking directions because you're not lost. If you're not lost, right. why would you ask directions? And so that's a very common example of how our biology predicts our behavior. All right, last one. This could be the big one. Eddie, what was the month and year of your first date? Mm. And now I do have a couch for you. <laughs> The month and the year of our first date, April 2001. All right. Kendra, let's see it. <sighs> oh. It was May. You went away. Our first date was at the Silver Diner. That was May when you went to Colorado and you came back. Is it a leather couch or? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like my home. Well, ju just to defend poor Eddie there. The hippocampus sounds like hippopotamus. That's sort of the memory center of the brain for these kinds of emotional issues. Women just have a bigger one than guys do. So women remember when you met, who you dated before you met, when you dated them first, <laughs> right? They got the whole thing figured out. And so actually, you're not hardwired to remember that. And Kendra, you absolutely are. Thanks for being such great sports, Eddie and Kendra. Appreciate it. Now, when I don't know the answer, I go to the best to learn it. Dr. Daniel Amen has studied more than 50,000 brains to learn why men and women bicker. He's also a psychiatrist and the author of The Brain in Love. Welcome. Thank you. Now, I got to ask right up that, how do you study 50,000 brains? Well, we've been doing it for a long time. We do a study called brain SPECT imaging. Mm -hmm. SPECT looks at blood flow and activity patterns in the brain, and it just gives you so much very interesting information. All right, now for everybody out there, just to make it clear, this is not sci-fi, but it's actually happening today. We actually brought examples of different scans that you selected for us. So if you look about at, at why people sort of bicker so much, why they can recall things and sort of get that, can you look at these scans and figure out how people respond when they're bickering when they're not? Yes. In fact, you know, what we typically see is she'll have trouble letting things go. Right. He'll have trouble paying attention. So if people are focused and fighting, it's, they have different brain images than if they're unfocused, diffuse and fighting. Right. So then how do you give them advice based on that? I mean, how do you sort of look at a, a couple that's not getting along and get into why they're not getting along and help them accordingly? Well, for me, it depends on how their brain works. You know, I mean, there's some, some simple rules for everyone. And so I give them a technique, I call it the bathroom technique. It's when you find out she's stuck <laughs> on something, tell her you have to go to the bathroom. Because you just need to get away for about two or three minutes, and then she'll be fine. Does that sound useful, guys? <laughs> All right. So what are the rules for women that you think might be most helpful to allow them to communicate with their mates based on what you know about how their brains are working? Well, number one, use less words. If you want him to listen to you, too often women overwhelm men mm -hmm. with words. Men then get distracted, and then they get irritated. They shut down. And in, in addition, I gather there, that there are other factors that women could use, to, to, as he discussed with their mates, ways of changing their behavior. For example, do you need to say it more than once? Well, that's what we find. Women, they get resentful. It's like, I'm not telling him more than once. And mm -hmm. I always say, you have to ask him right. more than once because he forgets. I mean, don't take it as, as a personal thing against you. It's just, and that's what, how What if he's are. watching TV and you're trying to talk to him? What about multitasking? Uh, no, don't do that. Because, <laughs> <laughs> especially, especially in the fourth quarter of the basketball game. Right. See, she can pay attention to everything that's going on, and for him, it gets him distracted and irritated. All right, so let's now we flip it around. What, what are the lessons that, that men ought to take to heart as they speak to, to the women that they love uh, but are periodically bickering with? Well, um... <laughs> what, about, what if I said, honey, can you get to the point, please? Does that work? Yeah, not really. No. Uh, I, I found that also. It doesn't work very well. Yeah. But why is that? Not really. Uh, because she has language on both sides of her brain. Men typically have language on the left side. Women have language on both sides. So they just have a lot more to say. When you tell her, you know, could you just get to the point, she feels offended. And don't try to solve her problems. Just listen. If you just feed back what you hear yeah. without telling her what to do, she'll figure yeah, out what to do. That's a wonderful point. I, actually, I get that from my daughters, because they come to me with an issue, and I immediately want to get in there and fix it, because I'm a surgeon. Right. And they say, you know, you don't have to fix the problem all the time. Just hear the problem. You can't always fix the feeling. You got to actually 
expose yourself to it a little bit. And what about a big mistake I see a lot of my friends make? I, of course, never make it, which is <laughs> to treat your wife like your buddy. Uh, don't expect your wife to act like your best guy friends. It won't work. Uh, just know that you're wired differently, and to that point, help her with the house. This is so critical because a woman has a larger limbic brain, she also has a larger nesting instinct. Mm -hmm. So her house is absolutely critical and if you can be really helpful to her at home, guess what? She'll have more energy, which means she'll have more energy for you. I like that. <laughs> yeah. you know, I've been married almost 25 years. I wish I'd met you earlier. It could have saved me a lot of heartache. I'm sure a lot of guys out there feel the same. Thank you very much for joining us, Doc Diamond. Dr. Right. Amen has been uh, opening my eyes and the eyes of other physicians for years with his great insights into how the brain works. I also want to thank our couple, Eddie and Kendra, for joining us and playing with us. Stay with us. The lack of sex does affect me physically. It doesn't seem to be a priority. A couple in crisis, their sex life DOA. There are a lot of folks out there who feel just like you do. Find out Dr. Oz's action plan to save them and you in the bedroom. Information you need. You want to do this? And later, the three warning signs in your mouth that could be telling you something's wrong. Third example is that. Let's start talking. Now the web to have a national conversation about health and wellness. This is a no embarrassment zone. There's no topic that's off limits. I came to work today, I'm so lucky. Yeah! And make sure you're sharing this information with the people you love. You're good to go. Be sure to subscribe to my channel. You don't miss anything. And remember to check back often to see what's new. Now, back to the show. Welcome back. The one thing we'll be talking about a lot this season is sex and the personal and medical reasons why you need it. Now we polled our audience today and 68% of you said you wish you were having more sex. Guess what? That ends today. <laughs> but first, I want you to meet this couple and see if their story sounds familiar. If I had to describe my sex life, I'd say that it was non-existent. Mike and I usually have sex about once every two months, if I'm lucky. Sex doesn't seem to be a priority. Whoa. We'll sit at the table. Life gets in the way. Our life is very chaotic in the morning. Maddie, it's time to get up. We both get up early. See you later, Mike. We're off to work. Get home around 8 o'clock at night. And I have to play catch up on housework. Fix supper. You know, by the time we clean up, it's 10 o'clock. My sex drive is stronger than Mike's, and so I can always find the energy to have sex. By the time I hit the bed at 11 o'clock, the last thing on my mind is exerting more energy. I do feel like kind of it's the man's place to initiate sex. I think it should go both ways. The lack of sex does affect me physically. I just feel more sluggish. I oftentimes feel disconnected from Mike. I feel lonely. I love Michelle. The last thing I want to do is have her feeling emotionally or sexually deprived. I feel like I don't know what to do, and I'm hoping Dr. Oz can help us get things back on track. You okay? Mm. You know, you're not alone. No, no, there are a lot of folks out there who feel just like you do. And I respect you both, both very much for coming out and joining us. Isn't that true, guys? So, you know, I heard both of you speaking in that little video piece, and Michelle, I mean, I'll start with you. And when you heard Mike saying those things about sex and, uh, and how it's working for him, what was going through your mind? What were you feeling? Just sadness, because we are not connecting on that level. Mike, what do you think when you hear about your wife's desire to have sex and a desire to feel satisfied through that process? And you know it's not happening. Um, well, it makes me feel bad, first of all. Um, you know, I love Michelle more than anything, and I just, 
it, it kills me to know that she's feeling lonely, you know, when I'm there. Um, why, why do you think it's so crucial to have sex? We, wanna, we want the marriage to work. We want to show the kids a, a stable, loving household. And, and you think without sex that won't happen? I think it can cause, like we're saying, it causes a disconnection. You start to, you, you move further apart from each other. Um, and in, in, in the end, most likely, you know, it's over. So I think, I think sex builds the intimacy level back and then, you know, it draws us closer together. It, it is, is the sadness you feel because you think it could hurt the relationship long term or is the lack of intimacy itself what's making you sad? I think both. I think uh, it's a loneliness. It's a, a lack of connection. It just really, I think it affects you emotionally and physically. Well, your intuition is, is actually completely on target because as a doctor, I'll speak to the numbers on this. Because you know, we're going to talk about the emotional issues, but I do want to focus on the health concerns first. You know, people who have sex live a lot longer, both men and women. Guys who have sex twice a week will live 50% longer in terms of their heart disease risk because they don't they have half the heart disease uh, that guys who aren't having sex will have and couples who are having mutual satisfying sex uh, note that the women actually will feel about eight years younger so these are big big numbers and it's difficult for me to underline that lo uh, enough and part of it is the loneliness that you're talking about but part of it is that sometimes there are medical reasons why this isn't happening so I've asked Michelle and Mike to step into the truth tube. Now, the truth tube is this place where we get this vital information, and just the raw data, numbers as they are, as we would look at them as clinicians, that we think can help us give you more guidance to find the fulfilling, healthier life that you desire. You willing to do this? Absolutely. All right, I mean, it's pretty in front of the data, but let's hop up. I've got your charts too, by the way. So, Michelle, why don't you hop up first? Now, the truth tube is going to give me the basic numbers that were obtained at a test that we did earlier. I mean, frankly, if I could have a stamp and just stamp healthy on your forehead, that's exactly what these numbers tell us. Now, that might not be the case for Mike. And when we come back, I'm going to reveal Mike's test results and find out if his problem is a medical one or an emotional issue. And sometimes it's both. And because you've got your pens out, and I want you to have them out, I'm going to give you a step-by-step -step plan to get Mike and Michelle's sex life back on track. And guess what? It could work for you, too. Don't go anywhere. We're just getting started. Dr. Oz's prescription to jumpstart their sex life and yours. Step one is the incredibly powerful tools you have in your kitchen right now. I actually eat two of these a day. And what's the problem? I have no idea. <laughs> I'm excited to be on Dr. Oz. Dr. Oz's show. So let's start talking. Now the web to have a national conversation about health and wellness. This is a no embarrassment zone. There's no topic that's off limits. I came to work today, I'm so lucky. Yeah. And make sure you're sharing this information with the people you love. You're good to go. Be sure to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss anything. And remember to check back often to see what's new. Now, back to the show. Welcome back. If the kids are in the room, you might want to cover their ears because this is sort of a sensitive topic. Now I'm here with Mike and Michelle. They're a married couple who are at the breaking point because they're not having sex. And they're not alone. But today, we can change all that. But first, I need to get Mike's test results. So the first bit of information I want to point out to you is that your thyroid levels are actually 2.5, which is not too bad. But then we check your testosterone. That's how much of that male hormone you have. And the number of 238 is low. You want it to be at least above 280. So you're quite a bit beneath where we want you to be. Now, that's an issue because that can affect a lot of the things that re regulate how a male mind works, but also how your body functions. Testosterone, for example, uh, is a predictor of diabetes. It causes problems in the risks of heart disease and hardening of the arteries. So there's a male risk factor that you've got that we're going to have to tackle. It also, of course, affects your libido because you're not going to want to have sex if you don't have the male sex drive hormone. Right. Now, that's an issue for you in particular because your waist size, which I understand you thought was 40 inches, mm -hmm. it's actually 55 inches. 
The belly fat in the waist <laughs> takes the testosterone that you naturally are making and changes it to estrogen. So you actually are making the hormone, but you're breaking it down. And of course, when I, we did some of these studies on you, for example, an ultrasound to see if right. your penis is working normally, it works. But when it's engulfed in fat and it has uh, an inadequate amount of testosterone, it's not gonna wanna wake up and go anywhere. Right. So that's one of the challenges I think that you and many, many folks out there watching. By the way, you know, all the guys out there, am I got this right? And we've got an audience that's half full of men. Uh, some of you actually know this firsthand, and I just want to emphasize that uh, because this comes up all the time. If the mechanics aren't functional, you're not going to want to have sex. You're not alone. A lot of folks feel the exact same way, but I don't want to tolerate it because I'm going to give you a, a prescription that I think can help you and many, many others out there. So the first part of the prescription, come on over with me. We've got it all lined up here. So let's start off with this stuff, garlic. Love it. You, know, you, you like garlic? Love yeah. it. Does, doesn't hurt your intimacy? Uh, uh, <laughs> no, we brush and mouthwash. <laughs> now here's why garlic is important. The garlic has a chemical called allicin in it that we actually didn't know much about. And this is an old remedy. People were talking about this in vitality and libido for centuries. But it turns out that chemical actually allows one of the very short-lived gases in the penis called nitric oxide to get flowing. And so that gas actually allows you to increase libido, but also helps with erectile function. So there's a couple good reasons to make garlic part of your diet. That's you know, a big part of, the, of mm -hmm. this prescription plan. Bananas, come on closer. Bananas aren't gonna scare you. The bananas themselves have bromelain in them. Bromelain is an anti-inflammatory chemical, and, and because of that, it actually reduces some of the irritation in the body, so you can function at full okay. speed. So that's sort of the step one of the prescription, is the, the incredibly powerful tools you have in your kitchen right now. And make these decisions in the grocery store. Bring these into the house, have them always there, easy for Mike to get a hold of. I actually eat two of these a day. You do? I do. And what's the problem? I have no idea. <laughs> no idea. All right. Now, Second big part of the plan are, are some of these tools that you have to go to the pharmacy to get. Vaginal lubricants can be used especially in women who are going through change of life because if you're not lubricated, it's not gonna be fun. And this is a big issue for a lot of women who lose their libido. Uh, the vitamin Bs are very, very important uh, for allowing the sex organs to function at full speed, especially vitamin B5, pentothoic acid, which is uh, a, a vitamin that a lot of Americans don't get enough of in their diet. And this is a little secret from South America, maca. MACA, it helps with erection problems, and it's used by people in that part of the world quite commonly. You can take it as a powder, they have it as a tea, uh, and it comes in capsules. So it's pretty easy for folks to get, uh, and it ought to be on your laundry list of things to do, in your toolbox, so to speak, if libido is part of your challenge. Now, I'm a medical doctor, and I take care of a lot of folks who have these issues, but the emotional side of it, I often ask experts to come along and help me with. And then remember, the emotional part of this is important for the long-term fix. Ian Kerner is joining us. Ian Kerner is a sex therapist. Uh, he's also the author of Love in a Time of Colic. Wonderful title. Thank you. Uh, Ian, what's the number one thing you think couples need to know if they're having problems with their intimacy? Well, first of all, I think this couple is not alone. Nearly 50 million Americans in this country identify themselves as being in a sex rut. So this is a big problem, and I do truly believe that great sex doesn't begin inside the bedroom, it begins outside the bedroom. As you've been saying throughout this show, the mind mm -hmm. is the biggest sex organ. I swear, the mind, not the genital. Studies show that if you hold hands, if you kiss, if you cozy up next to each other, if you engage in a 20-second hug, a 20-second hug, that's all it takes, it raises oxytocin levels. Oxytocin mm -hmm. is the cuddle hormone. So take the time. A 20 second hug can help outside the bedroom with having a great sex life inside the bedroom. 20 seconds is not a lot of time to ask no. for any intimacy you desire. Ian's gonna work with each of you to get you back on track. Ian, thank you very much for joining my us. Pleasure. And my doctor's order for everybody is you need to have sex at least, at least minimum once a week. Regular sex will not only help your relationship, but also your health. Because remember, regular sex leads to better cardiovascular health, better sleep, and a longer life. So you can enjoy it at the same time. So make the day the day you start your own sex life. Your relationship and your health are worth it. Now up next is your mouth sending warning signs about your health. 
There are three major warning symptoms that you can diagnose yourself. You'll learn about that when we come back. Three major health warning symptoms in your mouth. You can diagnose yourself. Breathe into my mouth, I can smell. Really? Yes. Find out why everything in your mouth, including your breath, is something you can't ignore. And later... Did anybody here have that question? <laughs> you might not admit it, but Dr. Oz has the answer to a question all of us have. So let's start talking. Now the web to have a national conversation about health and wellness. This is a no embarrassment zone. There's no topic that's off limits. I came to work today, I'm so lucky. Yeah. And make sure you're sharing this information with the people you love. You're good to go. Be sure to subscribe to my channel. You don't miss anything. And remember to check back often to see what's new. Now, back to the show. Your mouth says more than you realize. It can predict your health and tell you about serious issues like heart disease, diabetes, and stroke. Now I'm gonna give you three major warning signs that you don't wanna miss in your mouth. But before I tell you what to look for, I need a little bit of help. So every day, I'm gonna choose one audience member to be my assistant of the day. Let's find out who it's gonna be. You are all ready? All right, who's sitting? Seat number 12. 12? Are you 12? Yeah. Come on up. How are you? So let's, let's gown you here. Sure, she's excited. She's so excited. All right, now you get the help. Okay. But you're going to start off by talking about you. Wait, wait, what's your name? Julie. Julie. Where are you from, Julie? I'm from Hasbro Heights, New Jersey. Hasbro Heights, perfect. All right, the number one sign that can help you from your mouth comes from your gums. It's linked to heart disease and even to miscarriage. So I want you to take a quick look. Come on over here. I'm going to show you this animation. This is an animation of what the gums look like. So if you notice, we go scrolling around. Mm -hmm. Come closer to me over here. And so if you're looking close there, you can actually see that there are bacteria growing in there. And those bacteria, as they grow, they're setting up shop. They're growing a whole community. But what they're really doing is inflaming your gums. So the gums start to get angry and red. And as they get beefy, they actually begin to recede and pull down towards the bone. And then guess what? They pull away from the teeth. And they loosen the teeth. So actually, the major cause of tooth loss is not cavities. Mm -hmm. It's gingivitis. So because you're the assistant of the day, you get to sit in a dentist chair. Okay. Come. You can trust me. I'm a doctor. Okay. <laughs> All right, can you hop up here? You need a hand? No, I'm okay. Glad I picked the tall assistant of the day. There we are. Sorry. All right. This will only hurt a little bit. Okay. I'm kidding. Are you up okay. for this? All right. I don't know if they are, but okay. <laughs> are you guys up for it? Yeah. yeah. All right. Open your mouth. You sh show me your gums. I look like that. You can pull your gums down. It's better if you do it because that way I won't hurt you. Yeah, those are healthy gums. Now we're talking. Can you guys see that in the back? I can't tell. Those are healthy gums. Now, one second. I'm going to use this gum device. Does, that feel, does this all feel okay? Mm hmm. <laughs> it is sort of like sounds in the legs. Is that okay? Mm hmm. Aren't you glad you came to the show today? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Right. Did it feel okay? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Come on up. Yeah. Now, the one thing I do want to point out is I didn't use the floss in your, in your teeth, but floss, which we talk a lot about, mm -hmm. is so essential to, to dental health because it actually cleans about 40% more of your teeth than if you just brush. All right. Come on over here. So that's, so that's the first major sign that we have. The second major sign, come on over here. You get to join me. This part's more fun for you. you can, now. I want you to breathe into my mouth so I can smell. Really? Yes. <sighs> okay, now smell this. <sighs> Why is breath so important? If your breath is really sweet, we worry that you have diabetes. If your breath smells like ammonia, then we get concerned because that's what we look for in people who have kidney failure. And finally, halitosis, which is bad breath, big word saying the same thing. That happens if you've got dental caries or cavities, gingivitis will cause it. If you have other infections in your mouth and your throat, it all comes back through the, the breath that you breathe out. So 
when people have bad breath and no one tells them, you're actually not giving them an important clue about their own health. So, what are some tools for that? Have you ever seen one of these? The tongue scraper. Tongue scraper. So demonstrate it then. Hey, where's the camera? Okay. Oh. So expertly done. <laughs> Good. Is that the right side? I think Is it's it? this side. Oh. <laughs> Don't you hate when that happens? A national TV to boot. Okay. Yeah, that looks better. All right. Well, anyway, tongue scrapers actually do work because some of the bad breath that we have comes from the stuff we store in our tongues. And so scraping them off actually helps you clean your tongue. But this is an African chew stick. So try that. Chew on that. These are tools that have been used for a thousand years. You know, I love when... <laughs> how do you... Is that how they yeah, chew? Yeah, that's chew on it. This has been used for a thousand years. Well, what does it taste like, by the way? It tastes like the trees in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I thought. I knew. That's why I wouldn't taste it myself. No, here, here. Not that I go around no, tasting here, here, them. Here. But... I'm, I'm going to taste it myself. You take this part. Uh, yeah. No. No, it's better than that. It well, does. Whenever I find a treatment that's been used for a thousand years in any part of the world, I want to bring it back to everybody mm -hmm. because for some reason it seems to work. And guess what? We never knew why, but recently found out that these little chew sticks they're antimicrobial. They kill bacteria in your mouth. Oh. So they work really well. Mm -hmm. The third clue your mouth gives you mm -hmm. is your tongue itself. And in fact, I've got a warning sign list here of three tongues that you're gonna have to look at. Look at this one here. Come turn this way. What do you think of that? Oh, it's disgusting. So this is actually what thrush looks like, what candida looks like in the mouth. And what ends up when you have candida is you have fungus that overgrows the mouth. And when you have that fungal growth in the mouth, mm -hmm. that's a problem, of course, because it means that either you've got something going on from the medications you're taking, especially if you've been on antibiotics, mm -hmm. because they've wiped out the good bacteria, all you're left with is the fungus that can grow. Or sometimes you've got an immune problem, like diabetes, that weakens your immune system, all right? Second example of a tongue is a beefy red tongue. See, it's sort of engorged and large. That happens if you've got vitamin deficiencies, Kawasaki syndrome, which you've probably never heard of by name, and this is one of the things we look for, a, this, this beefy red tongue. Uh, that's, and again, you see it sometimes in, in the clinics. And the third example, and watch this carefully, is that. Oh. Okay. That's a black tongue, obviously, and that's a sign of bad oral hygiene. And that's the kind of tongue we look for. We try to figure out what's going on in someone's mouth. So come turn with me. Taste these. These are neem leaves. They're actually from East India. Again, a, a remedy that's been used for a long time. What do you think? You want to take them home with you? No, no, it has no taste, really. It's just like a dry, crunchy... No. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. Well, guess what? <laughs> Neem leaves remove plaque. They actually are very effective at taking out some of those bacteria and the plaque around the teeth that we know are so important in maintaining oral health, but they're also helpful for the keeping the tongue clean because they're antimicrobials. So all of these products, by the way, that I mentioned, they, they might not be words that you're familiar with, but all of these are available in health food stores, they're available online, they're easy to get. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank it. you. Next, your most embarrassing questions coming up. Stay right here. Dr. Oz has the answers. I see a follow-up here. <laughs> Chances are it's a question you've always wanted to ask the doctor. And don't miss. This is one of my favorites. What's in this that can boost your sex life? Find out later. So let's start talking. Now the web to have an international conversation about health and wellness. This is a no embarrassment zone. There's no topic that's off limits. I came to work today, I'm so lucky. Yeah. And make sure you're sharing this information with the people you love. You're good to go. Be sure to subscribe to my channel. You don't miss anything. And remember to check back often to see what's new. Now, back to the show. It's time for one of my favorite parts of this show, Ask Dr. Oz. You know, I love hearing your questions, and just remember, this is a no embarrassment zone. There's no topic that's off limits, and there's no question I won't answer. All right, so who's first? Oh, got a volunteer already. Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Oz, my name is Tammy. My question is, when I get a little frisky or in the mood, I have small sneezing attacks. 
every time. Well, thank you, Tammy. Here, you can hold the mic. Thank you. All right, so here's the deal. When you get frisky, as you say, you actually get engorgement of some tissues. They're not always the tissues down below. You actually get engorgement of other tissues, like in your mouth. And so if your nasal tissues get engorged, that actually can irritate them a little bit. It's not a bad thing, but you'll start to sneeze. You start to get uh, sometimes a little bit of runny nose and all that sort of fits together in that general constellation of you getting ready to be even more than frisky. Fair okay. enough? Fair enough, thank you. <laughs> <All right. laughs> okay. Next question. Go ahead. Hi, Dr. Oz, my name is Maureen. Uh, my question is, a few of my friends have gone completely bare down there. And I'm wondering, are there any health risks associated with waxing it all away? Well, it turns out going bare down there is getting fairly common. Uh, and it was thought that that hair had a couple important purposes, because we, we never have anything in our body that's not supposed to be there. It's all there for uh, uh, at least one reason. The hair probably prevents chafing. Uh, and some people argue that the hair actually traps the odor, which is a good thing. Even though sometimes women are embarrassed by it, it's actually attractive to men. It's where we store our pheromones. But the one risk with going bare is the possibility that you might get an infection from an ingrown hair or something along those lines. So as long as you're hygienic about how you do it and you, you have people helping you, you are helping people help you, do you have someone help you? Uh, well, I mean, I haven't gone, so that's why I oh, asked exactly. you. Okay. Like, I, <laughs> I mean, I get a bikini wax, so yes, there's health there. Perfect. But, yeah. I, I okay. see a follow-up here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in, in general, I think it's just fine. Okay. It's All right. Thank you very much, Marie. All right, next question. Oh, I'll go up the stairs. Hi, Dr. Oz. My name is Susan. And my question is, as we get older, why do our toenails get yellow and hard? Well, there are a couple reasons that happen. Can I see them? Oh, here. Ah, oh, I feel like Cinderella here. Here, take your shoes off. <laughs> All right, let me see if the shoe fits. But angle it down a tiny bit. There we are. See, these nails are actually fairly typical. One thing we always worry about is fungal infections of the nails. And when you get a fungal infection, by the way, which is not a dangerous thing, but it's unsightly, then you have to take oral pills, which do have some side effects, including, by the way, the possibility that they'll hurt your liver. Uh, so a lot of folks, because it might not be a fungus, and I don't think yours is because it's not flaking, will it just soak their feet in vinegar or tea? And, but what that actually does is dries it out a little bit, uh, and if there are bacteria that are in there, which is possible, then it'll kill those bacteria. So that's one thing you might want to try. Uh, the other thing, of course, is wearing shoes that are open-toed as you are, not wearing socks and shoes that trap moisture, very, very important in maintaining t uh, nail health. And as your bony structure of your feet, feet changes, you get older, sometimes you bump those nails into the shoes more commonly. Helpful? Yes. Thank, thank you. you very much. All right, now. We got also a question that's not in the studio. We have the OzCam. And so if I can hear our OzCam question. Hi, Dr. Oz, I have a question. Is it bad to hold in my poop? Ooh. All right, so here's the deal. It's not a problem to hold your poop for a couple hours, or maybe even up to 10, 12 hours. But the reason I don't like people holding their poop in is because if you do it chronically, you can actually hurt the lining of the intestinal tract. And there are nerves that contract our intestines and push it and squeeze it the way it's supposed to be squeezed. And so if you're bulging out the intestines because you're trapping your poop for longer than you want it to be trapped, as you get older, that can become a problem. Uh, but for an hour or two, it's probably a good idea if, uh, if, you, if you're in a place that's not opportune for you. All right, when we come back, the secret to boosting your sex life, but without drugs. Stay with us. It turns on this chemical system in your brain that we know is so crucial for allowing that libido to flow freely. Is there a natural Viagra? Dr. Oz reveals three organic sex boosters. So let's start talking. Now the web to have a national conversation about health and wellness. This is a no embarrassment zone. There's no topic that's off limits. I came to work today, I'm so lucky. And make sure you're sharing this information with the people you love. You're good to go. Be sure to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss anything. And remember to check back often to see what's new. Now, back to the show. Viagra is the most prescribed medicine for sexual dysfunction. Prescriptions have been written for 35 million men around the world. But did you know that there are also natural alternatives for both men and women that can boost your libido? Well, today I'm revealing three of them. Mona and Keith are joining me. How are you? Hi. Hi, Keith. How are you? See, All right. So they're a lucky couple. And what I'm going to do is have them try these out. I bet you'll like them, but we'll see. 
You ready to play? Sure. Yeah. All right, everyone's excited. All right, Keith. So the first sex booster is actually a pretty simple dish. It's Asian ginseng, and we put it into this Korean ginseng chicken soup, which is a pretty common meal uh, eaten in Korea. So take a sip, see what you think. I'll share it with you. It's a little bland, but it tastes good. <laughs> All right, yeah. here's why it's so cool, because Asian ginseng actually releases nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is this very short-lived gas, and it is a gas that's very important for opening up the blood vessels that supply the penis. And so it allows you both to act on your impulse, but also to get you jazzed up for the moment. Now, my good friend, who's a, a medicine hunter, has always told me about this tool. Come closer, Mona. This is actually ashwagandha. So take a step. This is ashwagandha okay. tea. Okay. It actually belongs to the pepper family, and it promotes relaxation of these really cool it does that. taste a little peppery. Mm -hmm. It does. You like it? A little bit like green tea. All right. Now, one of the reasons it works in helping you relax is because it turns on this chemical system in your brain that we know is so crucial for allowing that libido to flow freely. Okay. Do you have a hard time relaxing? A um, little bit, yeah. So you think you might you want to take it home with you? The sure. Keep going to try it sure. out. Yeah. Now, that's well, for one. That's for one. Yeah. Right. <laughs> now, this is the one that I think all of us can try, and this is one of my favorites. It's called rhodiola. Rhodiola is used, actually, in Siberia by the Russians to maintain not only their libido, but their vitality. And it works by breaking down dopamine and serotonin at the right amount. So it slows down your loss of those key chemicals for vitality. So put your tongue out. Ah. Keith? Oh. <laughs> he puts his tongue out so far, he wants two drops. Right, what do you think? Ooh. Tastes like alcohol a little bit. Oh. Pretty powerful, huh? What, yeah, is strong. what is rhodiola? Rhodiola is a root from the plant, the rhodiola. And you know how you can actually have it sometimes? You can put it in vodka. Mm -hmm. And it makes the vodka this really light pink color. So, so we actually have parties sometimes. You put a little bit of rodeo in the vodka. <laughs> they think it's some exotic right. drink. But it's actually a libido booster. Anyway, <laughs> now these are not mainstream. You, know, you haven't even heard some of these phrases before, but you'll hear them more and more as they become more commonplace. But they're all available um, in health food stores and, and, and over the web. And again, because these are herbal therapies, you want to read up on them before you start taking them willy-nilly, because they do have sometimes effects on other medications that you may be taking. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Laura, thank you very much. Thank you. Keith, appreciate Thanks it. For having Up so next, fun. my doctor's orders. The three most important things I want you to remember today. We'll be right back. So let's start talking. Now the web to have a national conversation about health and wellness. This is a no embarrassment zone. There's no topic that's off limits. I came to work today, I'm so lucky. Yeah. And make sure you're sharing this information with the people you love. You're good to go. Be sure to subscribe to my channel. You don't miss anything. And remember to check back often to see what's new. Now, back to the show. Here are three things I want you to remember from today's show. Men and women, you're hardwired differently. So women, use less words and you can go ahead and ask more than once. An active sex life is vital to your health. So have sex at least once a week. And finally, your mouth can be a predictor of your health. So watch for warning signs like gingivitis. Those are my doctor's orders. Now take whatever you've learned today and just tell one other person. Let's do this work together. See you next time.
Be sure to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss anything. And remember to check back often to see what's next.